so uh, last time I ended by talking about discrete groups of isometries and also the classification of isometries. So let me just recall the classification of isometries of a cat minus one space. Uh, right, so there were three types. Uh, either elliptic, that means you have a fixed point in the cat minus one space, X naught. The fixed point set is non-empty. Otherwise parabolic, that means uh, there are no fixed points in the cat minus one space, but there is a, a unique fixed point on the boundary. Okay, so the elliptic will preserve spheres around the fixed point X naught. The parabolic will preserve horospheres based at the boundary point, at the boundary fixed point. And then you also have the third type, which is hyperbolic. Then you have two fixed points on the boundary, uh, xi and eta. And what happens is the geodesic joining xi to eta, it's a bi-infinite geodesic. Uh, that geodesic is left invariant under gamma because gamma fixes its endpoints. So it has to fix the geodesic by uniqueness of the geodesic joining these endpoints. And so restricted to this geodesic, it's just an isometry from the real line to itself uh, without fixed points. And so it must be a translation along this uh, geodesic. Okay, it must be a translation along this geodesic. So what happens is points will move along the geodesic towards one of the uh, fixed points on the boundary. So that fixed point is called the attracting fixed point and denoted gamma plus and uh, points will move away from the other fixed point. So that fixed point is called the repelling fixed point and it's denoted gamma minus. And what will happen is if you look at the space, then you can, uh, for example, if this was hyperbolic space, then for any point on this geodesic, you have a, a a perpendicular, uh, a copy of HN minus one, uh, which is, uh, which passes through this and which is perpendicular to this geodesic. So that divides your space into two half spaces. And what happens is these half spaces will be moved into each other. I mean, they'll move up basically. And uh, so, so you have this hyperplane this hyperplane will move up along the geodesic. So all points inside the cat minus one space will converge towards the attracting fixed point. If you iterate gamma in positive time, and if you iterate backwards, you look at uh, negative powers of gamma, then they'll converge to the uh, uh, repelling fixed point in backward time. So I wanted to say a little bit more about uh, this classification of isometries. Uh, in terms of what's called uh, the displacement function and translation lens. So here's the setup. So X is a proper cat minus one space. Uh, proper means as usual that closed and bounded balls are compact. And gamma is an isometry of X. So then you can define what's called the displacement function of gamma. It's this function D sub gamma of X is the distance between X and gamma X, where X is a point in the cat minus one space. So this measures how much gamma moves points, okay? So this is a non-negative function. And so it's bounded below, so we can look at its infimum. And the infimum of this displacement function over the whole space is defined to be what's called the translation length of gamma. Okay, so this is denoted by L gamma. This is the infimum of this displacement function D gamma. And then uh, we define a set called min gamma. So min gamma is uh, the set of points where uh, the displacement function attains its minimum, its infimum. Okay, so this set could be empty. It may not attain its infimum. All right, but uh, anyway, we can still define this set. So this is the set where uh, points move the least, okay? 
So then the classification of isometries, you can give in terms of uh, these uh, quantities, this translation length and this min gamma. Actually, it corresponds to the following. So gamma is elliptic if and only if min gamma is non-empty and L gamma is zero. Okay. Right. Uh, is this clear? Because uh, this is if and only if gamma has a fixed point in the space. Right. Then the min, then that the displacement of that point will be zero. So that will become the infimum and uh, the infimum will be attained at that fixed point. Okay. So elliptic case corresponds to the case where min gamma is non-empty non and the length of gamma is zero, the translation length. Then we have the parabolic case. So the parabolic case corresponds to the case where min gamma is empty. So the infimum is not attained, but the length is uh, still zero. Okay. So that means you have points in the cat minus one space, which move uh, very little. Okay. Uh, so actually what happens is in this picture for the parabolic case, uh, what happens is as you converge, uh, towards, so for example, uh, in the parabolic case, if I take a geodesic, which ends at the a uh, fixed point on the boundary, then what will happen is the image of this geodesic will be another geodesic which ends at the same point on the boundary because that boundary point is fixed. And if I look at points along this geodesic, then it's a, a feature of cat minus one spaces that two geodesics which have the end, the same endpoint on the boundary, they converge towards each other exponentially. So the distance between these two geodesics goes to zero exponentially. And what happens is, uh, if I take a point on this geodesic far out, it will move to a point on this geodesic. And the distance between these two will be going to zero as you go further along the geodesic. Okay, so this is why the infimum will be zero, uh, but it will not be attained in the space. Okay, so as you tend towards the fixed point, the displacement function will tend to zero. All right, that's the parabolic case. And then uh, the hyperbolic case corresponds to the case where min gamma is non-empty and uh, L gamma, the length is positive. Okay, so in this case, what happens is in the hyperbolic case, it turns out that, uh, well, we know the fixed point set is just a two point set on the boundary, attracting and repelling fixed point. And uh, min gamma, in this case is actually the bi-infinite geodesic joining the two fixed points. So the displacement function attains its minimum along uh, this uh, bi-infinite geodesic. And uh, along this geodesic, it's a translation that the amount by which it translates is exactly L gamma, the translation length. Okay. So that's one reason why it's called the translation length. Because uh, restricted to this geodesic, it is a translation by the amount L gamma. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. What happened? Uh, where are we? Okay. Uh, yeah. So excuse me, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so there is another thing that this translation length uh, can be defined as uh, some limit of a ratio. Is this towards them? 
that is uh, somewhere i have seen that uh, translation right, right, of right right uh, you mean you take uh, powers of the element and then divide by n right right yeah i think that's correct uh, i think that's correct yes. i think that's correct okay. yeah okay. so you look at okay. i think uh, the distance between x and gamma power nx and you divide that by n, yes, right? And take, take that, the that left, yes. tend to infinity. That, that 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 will give you the same thing. That's correct. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's because uh, see, that's quite easy to see. Because, and that will be true for any point. So what happens is you take a point y. And then there's what's called the nearest point projection onto this geodesic joining the attracting and repelling fixed points. Okay. So you get a point X on this geodesic. Now, if I apply gamma power N, okay, then uh, Y will move to gamma power N Y. Right, and gamma power n is an isometry. So the distance between y and x is the same. If I call this distance, say, d, uh, the distance between gamma power n y and gamma power n x is also d, right? right. So, uh, so what is the distance between gamma power n y and y? By the triangle inequality, the distance between gamma power n y and y uh, this differs by the distance from uh, uh, gamma power n x and x. This is less than or equal to 2d by the triangle inequalities, right? right. So this distance is bounded and this distance gamma power n x x is uh, n times length of gamma, uh, n times length of gamma. So therefore this means that distance gamma power n y y, this is equal to n times length of gamma plus something which is bounded. It's a big O of one. So if I divide by n, then this n and n cancels this becomes big O of one over N and this converges to length of gamma. Is this clear? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So now I want to come back to groups acting geometrically on a cat minus one space. So suppose gamma acts geometrically on X. That means it acts by isometries and the action is proper. Um, so then if gamma is co-compact, that means the quotient X mod gamma is compact, then it turns out that all gamma, all elements of gamma are either elliptic or hyperbolic. You cannot have any parabolics if the action is co-compact. So in other words, in terms of this min gamma, this set min gamma, what that means is uh, min gamma uh, parabolic corresponds to the case where min gamma is empty. The other two cases, elliptic and hyperbolic, correspond to the case where min gamma is non-empty. So if the action is co-compact, then you can show that min gamma is non-empty. And so it must be either elliptic or hyperbolic. So I've given a little proof here, but I don't know if we have time. Let me, okay, let me just quickly do this. So if gamma is compact, uh, co-compact, then you fix a compact set K uh, such that the union of its translates covers the whole space. Then given any element gamma, uh, I want to show its, its min gamma is non-empty. So I choose a, a sequence Xn uh, such that the distance Xn and gamma Xn converges to the infimum, the length of gamma. Okay. Now, since gamma is co-compact, I can choose for every n an element alpha n in gamma 
such that alpha n of xn belongs to this compact k. I can move it back into the compact. Okay. Now let beta n be the conjugate of gamma by alpha n. So alpha n gamma alpha n inverse. All right. So now this sequence alpha n xn, this is a sequence in this compact k. So we can pass to a subsequence and assume that without loss of generality that this alpha n xn converges to some element y in k. So let uh, yn be the sequence alpha n xn. Uh, then if I look at the distance between yn and beta yn, what is this? So yn is alpha n xn, beta n is alpha n gamma alpha n inverse, and then yn is alpha n xn. So the alpha n inverse and the alpha n will cancel. So this becomes the distance between alpha n xn and alpha n gamma xn. And alpha n is an isometry, so I can remove it from this distance. So this is the same as the distance xn gamma xn. And this by our choice of xn, this converges to L gamma. Okay. So what does that mean? These yn's are converging to y. And these beta n's are moving yn to a bounded distance of yn, right? The distance between yn and beta yn is converging to length of gamma. So in other words, if I choose a ball around the limit of yn's, if I choose a ball around y of length bigger than the L gamma, say of length of radius L gamma plus one, then for all n large enough, we have that beta n of y will belong to this ball, right? That follows from this limit here, okay? Because yn's are converging to y and the distance between yn's and beta yn's is, uh, uh, converging to L gamma. So if I choose any radius bigger than L gamma, say L gamma plus one, then beta and Y for all N large will belong to this ball. And the closure of this ball is compact and the action is proper. So that means that this set beta N is actually finite, right? By properness of the action. That's the definition of properness of the action. So we can, so since this set is finite, we can pass to a subsequence such that the beta ends are constant, equal to some beta in gamma. Okay. So without loss of generality, we can assume all the beta ends are equal to beta. Then if I look at the distance between y and beta y, so the y ends are converging to y. So this is the same as the distance between the limit of the distance y n beta y n. And uh, beta is equal to beta n. So I can replace this beta by beta n. So this becomes distance y n beta n y n. And this limit we've seen above is equal to L gamma. So that means the distance between y and beta y is exactly equal to L gamma. Okay. So we get L gamma is equal to distance y beta y. And now I know that beta is equal to beta n. So I can replace this beta by beta n, which is alpha n gamma alpha n inverse y. And now alpha n inverse is an isometry. So I can apply alpha n inverse to both of these points. So this becomes the same as the distance between alpha n inverse y and gamma of alpha n inverse y. In other words, this becomes the displacement function d gamma at the point alpha n inverse y. So therefore, d gamma of alpha n inverse y equals L gamma, which is the infimum of d gamma. Therefore, alpha n inverse y belongs to min gamma for all n. And so min gamma is non-empty. And therefore, gamma is either elliptic or hyperbolic. Okay. So as a special case, uh, if your isometries don't have fixed points, then uh, they cannot be elliptic. So then you'll get that all elements are hyperbolic, except for the identity element, of course. So that happens, for example, when you take the universal cover of uh, X bar, which is a closed Riemannian manifold. So closed means compact manifold without boundary uh, with sectional curvature less than or equal to minus one. Then X, which is the universal cover of X bar, this will be a cat minus one space uh, by Alexandrov's theorem because it's a complete simply connected Riemannian manifold. 
of sectional curvature less than or equal to minus one. So the universal cover of this closed negatively curved manifold is a cat minus one space. And we know that uh, the fundamental group uh, pi one of X bar, let me call that gamma, this acts geometrically on X, right? It acts by isometries and uh, co-compactly uh, and properly since the quotient is X bar, which is compact. And also it acts by deck transformations so we know that if a deck transformation has a fixed point, it must be the identity, right? So any non-identity element has no fixed points. So therefore it cannot be elliptic. And uh, therefore by the previous uh, proof, it follows that all non-trivial elements of gamma are hyperbolic, okay? So in this case, when I take the universal cover of a closed negatively curved manifold, then all elements of the fundamental group, all non-trivial elements are actually hyperbolic, okay? So that's why I was saying the hyperbolic case is the one we're most interested in because typically, in a sense, all, all or most elements will be hyperbolic, okay? So they'll have this north-south north dynamics with an attracting fixed point and a repelling fixed point. Now this we can also see um, these hyperbolic elements, the translation length, we can actually read from the quotient, from the closed manifold below as the length of a closed geodesic. So let me explain that. So suppose gamma is an element of the fundamental group, which is non-trivial. So what is an element of the fundamental group? It is a fixed endpoint homotopy class of loops right by definition now in when you look at the fundamental group then you allow homotopies of loops which fix the base point right but we can also look at free homotopies of loops where you allow the base point to move right so clearly any fixed point fixed endpoint homotopy class is contained in a unique free homotopy class of loops yes okay yeah. Right. Now, this is a fact about negative, closed negatively curved manifolds. This free homotopy class of loops, it contains a unique closed geodesic. So, uh, I mean, the picture is something like this. For example, if I would to take a hyperbolic surface, let's say a hyperbolic surface of genus two, like this. Then I take some loop, so it may not be a geodesic, some wiggly loop like this, but this I can homotope, basically I can homotope it to decrease the length and I keep decreasing the length until I reach in that homotopy class, a curve of shortest length in that homotopy class. And that will be the unique closed geodesic in that homotopy class. Okay, so you see, this is the unique closed geodesic in the free homotopy class. Okay, I have to allow free homotopies, not based homotopies. Is this clear? So let me, uh, I've given a proof of this. And, and, but before that, let me just say, what is the translation? So this element gamma of the fundamental group, it acts on the universal cover as an isometry, a hyperbolic isometry. And uh, so it's a, it has some positive translation length. That positive translation length L gamma is nothing but the length of this closed geodesic. Okay, so the translation length above can also be viewed below as the length of this closed geodesic in the free homotopy class, which contains the based homotopy class of the loop gamma. Okay. So let me explain this a bit. I've given a proof in the, the lecture notes. Uh, 
So let me just do that proof maybe quickly. Right, so here it is. Okay, so each free homotopy, can you see this? Yes. Maybe I'll make it a bit larger. Yes. Oh. Yeah, okay. So, uh, right. So I've made it a bit larger. I'll make it a bit smaller. So, yeah, okay. All right, so each free homotopy class of closed curves contains a unique closed geodesic. So how do we see this? So suppose you start with a closed curve alpha in X bar below, okay? So then alpha is a based homotopy class. Uh, so let me call the, uh, the homotopy class. Uh, so alpha is a closed curve and its based homotopy class is uh, an element of the fundamental group gamma, okay? Gamma is a hyperbolic isometry. Now let me, I can lift the closed curve alpha to the universal cover, right? And the lift to, I can lift it to X in other words, and the lift will be gamma invariant, right? So if I lift it, what will happen is if Y is the starting point of alpha tilde, the lift. And so if I lift it once, uh, then I get the, the new endpoint will be gamma y, right? Uh, that's just by definition of the action of the fundamental group uh, on the universal cover. So what, and then I can lift it to a bi-infinite curve, okay? So, uh, so this alpha tilde will be a map from R, the real line into my cat minus one space X and it will be gamma invariant. So because it's gamma invariant, what will happen? This piece here will map to a next piece under gamma, and then that piece will map to a next piece under gamma and so on. But we know that gamma under iteration of gamma, everything converges to the attracting fixed point in positive time, and it converges to the uh, negative fix, the repelling fixed point in negative time. So this loop alpha tilde, this curve alpha tilde rather, this bi-infinite curve, it will converge to gamma plus in positive time and it will converge to gamma minus in negative time, okay? So it will join gamma plus to gamma minus. Now I know that I take the geodesic joining gamma plus to gamma minus. Let me call that gamma tilde, okay? Then what we can do is we can do a homotopy in X, in the cat minus one space, from this curve alpha tilde to the curve gamma tilde. So I've written it down, but I'll just uh, explain it from the picture. So you choose this point Y in alpha tilde, and you choose any point X in gamma tilde, okay? And then we look at gamma Y and we look at gamma X. So we parameterize uh, alpha tilde and gamma tilde, such that uh, alpha tilde goes from y to gamma y as t goes from zero to one and gamma tilde goes from x to gamma x as t goes from zero to one. And then what we do is for any t between zero and one, we join alpha tilde t to gamma tilde t by the unique geodesic in x, okay, right? And I do this for all T now. And uh, then basically, if I move a distance S along this geodesic, that means uh, I move a distance which divides this geodesic in the ratio S is to one minus S, okay? Then I'll get a, a curve here, right? I'll get a curve like this. And this curve will start when S is zero, this curve will be alpha tilde. When S is one, this curve will be gamma tilde. So this will give a homotopy. And this I do for all T going from minus infinity to plus infinity. And because alpha tilde and gamma tilde are both invariant under the isometry gamma, this uh, homotopy will be gamma invariant. Okay. And that what that means is that it will descend 
to a homotopy of closed curves in the quotient because it's gamma invariant. The gamma invariance means basically that this homotopy, if I call it H of ST, then H of S comma T plus one will be gamma of H of S of T. Okay. So I'll get a homotopy below in the quotient X bar, H bar of S of T of S comma T will be the projection pi of H of ST, right? Where pi is the projection from the universal cover X to the quotient X bar. It's the quotient map. So this will give me a homotopy. And this gamma tilde, when I look at it in the quotient, this gives me a closed geodesic, right? Because X and gamma X, they map to the same point. And uh, the image of a geodesic will be a geodesic below. So this will be a closed geodesic below. And so this alpha tilde below will map to alpha. So that will become homotopic to a closed geodesic. Okay. Is that clear? Okay, so that's how you get a homotopy, a free homotopy to a closed geodesic. And then for the uniqueness of this closed geodesic in the free homotopy class, uh, if beta is another closed geodesic, which is freely homotopic to alpha, then you can lift beta tilde. Okay, and then uh, because beta is uh, freely homotopic to alpha, you can lift the free homotopy to the universal cover. And so that will tell you that beta tilde and alpha tilde will be within bounded distance of each other. So uh, if alpha tilde converges to gamma plus and gamma minus, then beta tilde will also converge to gamma plus and gamma minus. That means the lift of beta, uh, beta tilde will be a bi-infinite geodesic joining gamma plus to gamma minus. But in a cat minus one space, such a geodesic is unique, joining any two points on the boundary. So that means that uh, beta tilde will be equal to gamma tilde. So then when you project below, that means that beta will be equal to gamma. Okay, the closed geodesics will be the same. So therefore you get uniqueness of the closed geodesic. All right. And as you can see here in this picture, this distance from X to gamma X, this is the translation length of gamma. And this is also the length of the closed geodesic, right? Because this X and gamma X, they map to the same point in the quotient. So that gives you a circle below, right? And the length of that circle is the distance from X to gamma X, which is the translation length. Okay, is this clear? Yes? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, so the translation length can be interpreted as the uh, length of the unique closed geodesic in the free homotopy class of that of a given element of the fundamental group. So this defines what's called the length function of X bar. So this is a function L X bar from the fundamental group to uh, zero infinity, which maps gamma to the length of gamma. All right. So you can think of it in two ways. Either length of gamma is the translation length for the action on the universal cover or gamma you think of as, that's when you think of gamma as an isometry acting above. Otherwise, you think of gamma as a based homotopy class of loops below. Then that based homotopy class of loops is contained in a unique free homotopy class of loops. That free homotopy class of loops contains a unique closed geodesic. And this L gamma is the length of that closed geodesic. Okay, so now we can define what's called the marked length spectrum of X bar of the closed manifold below. This is the pair pi one X bar comma L X bar. In other words, the pair, which is the fundamental group. So this is topological information. And then the length function, the length function is geometric information because it contains the lengths of closed geodesics. Okay, and now, <coughs> <coughs> if X bar and Y bar are two closed negatively curved N manifolds, then we say that X bar and Y bar have the same Mach length spectrum. What does that mean? If there is an isomorphism between fundamental groups, phi from pi one X bar to pi one Y bar, which preserves lengths of closed geodesics. So what does that mean? 
that means that the length function of y bar composed with phi is equal to the length function of x bar. Okay. So then we say that they have the same marked length spectrum. Okay. So I should just mention this marked length spectrum. Here you have the length function. So it is more information than what's called the length spectrum. The length spectrum is just a set. It's the set of closed geodesics, the lengths of closed geodesics. The length spectrum, it's well known, even for hyperbolic surfaces in dim dimension two, the length spectrum is not enough to determine the isometry type of the, of the manifold. So even in two dimensions, there are famous examples due to Sunada of uh, hy closed hyperbolic surfaces which have the same length spectrum, but not, uh, but which are not isometric. Okay. So the length spectrum is not enough, but this marked length spectrum has more information because it tells you which element of the fundamental group has what length. It's a function. It's not a set. Okay. It's a function, the length function. So it has the information of the fundamental group there. And uh, this leads to what's called the marked length spectrum rigidity conjecture or problem, uh, which was, uh, I should mention, it's, uh, it was first stated by Burns and Cuttock in 85. That if X bar and Y bar have the same marked length spectrum, are they isometric? So is this information enough to determine the isometry type of the manifold? And it turns out it's a theorem due independently to Otal and to Croke in the early 90s, around 1992, uh, that the answer is yes in two dimensions. So for uh, surfaces of a variable negative curvature, negative curvature, but variable, not constant curvature, variable negative curvature, the marked length spectrum determines the surface up to isometry. Okay. So this is in contrast with the length spectrum. Like I said, in even in dimension two, there are negatively curved surfaces with the same length spectrum, but which are not isometric. But if you uh, add the extra information of the marked length spectrum, then they have to be isometric in dimension two. And uh, this, this problem is still open for dimension n greater than or equal to three. Okay. All right. So it's an old problem now. It's still open. On the other hand, now for closed hyperbolic manifolds, we have a better statement. So hyperbolic means constant sectional curvature equal to minus one. Then we have what's called the Mostar rigidity theorem, which states the following. Uh, <coughs> it says if X bar and Y bar are closed hyperbolic N manifolds, where N is at least three, then if there is an isomorphism between fundamental groups, uh, then in fact phi this isomorphism is induced by an isometry f from x bar to y bar okay such that phi is equal to f star so for hyperbolic manifolds that means constant curvature a closed hyperbolic manifolds and this dimension n greater than or equal to three is important this is false in dimension two uh, but for n greater than or equal to three uh, if uh, two closed hyperbolic manifolds have isomorphic fundamental groups, so that's purely topological information, then they are isometric. Okay? Then they are isometric. So the, in this case, the fundamental group itself determines the manifold up to isometry for a hyperbolic manifold, closed hyperbolic manifold of dimension at least three. Okay. So we're going to try and sketch a proof of this. 
All right. So, uh, so let me now come to what will be a crucial ingredient in the proof is uh, what is called conformal measures. Is that unique? I mean, I saw on the internet. It is unique. This Sorry, F what is? F, F is, uh, F is uh, unique. Yeah. Uh, I think, yes. Okay. And uh, I have uh, one question on this. So, is there any relation between automorphism of pi on of x bar and isometric group of pi on of x bar? Uh, isometric group of x bar? Are they there is, a, I mean, some isomorphism between from this most rigid region. Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, if you have an automorphism of pi one x bar, then it induces an isometry. Correct, that's true. And yeah. uh, vice versa, if you have an isometry, it will give you an automorphism of the fundamental group. Uh, mm -hmm. So actually, it's not. Uh, you have to take uh, the thing is, it may not preserve the base point mm -hmm. of the fundamental group. So you have to uh, uh, quotient by what are called inner automorphisms of the fundamental group. So the outer automorphism group, which is the automorphism group quotiented by the inner automorphisms, that will be isomorphic to the isometry group of X bar. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. So now, uh, let me talk about conformal maps first. So you may or may not have seen this. So first of all, what is a conformal map between Riemannian manifolds? So a diffeomorphism between Riemannian manifolds from F, F from F to N, M to N, is said to be conformal if there is a positive function lambda from M to R plus, such that for any X in M and for any tangent vector, non-zero tangent vector at x, uh, the norm of dfx v divided by the norm of v is equal to lambda x. So what does this mean? The point is that this is this ratio is independent of v. Okay, so in other words, what is this ratio? This is telling you how much f stretches tangent vectors, right? This is the stretch factor in the direction v. What this means is that the stretch factor is the same in all directions. Okay. The stretch factor of DF is the same in all directions. So conformal maps infinitesimally, they stretch distances by the same amount in all directions. Okay. The point is this is independent of the direction V at X. Is this clear? So another way to see this, what this means is what? If this means that if I take V to be a unit vector, then the norm of dfx V is constant, equal to lambda X. In other words, the unit sphere maps to a sphere in the tangent space. So this will be, this is a sphere in the tangent space Tx M. <coughs> and this is Dfx. This goes to a sphere in the tangent space Tfx N. All right, so what this means is that Df maps spheres in the tangent space to spheres in the tangent space. All right. That's equivalent to saying this. So a conformal map is one which maps infinitesimal spheres to infinitesimal spheres. All right. So in two dimensions, uh, in two dimensions, uh, 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 if F is orientation preserving, that means if it's a map from C to C, orientation preserving um, and conformal according to this definition, then it's just a holomorphic map. It's nothing but a holomorphic map. Okay. So these are generalizations in a sense, if you like, of 
holomorphic maps to higher dimensions. Okay, holomorphic maps map infinitesimal circles to infinitesimal circles. Conformal maps in uh, between Riemannian manifolds map infinitesimal spheres to infinitesimal spheres. Okay. But now I want to, this uses the smooth structure, right, of the manifolds. I want a definition of conformal maps for metric spaces without any smooth structure. So let me first rephrase this condition in terms of just distances. So note that uh, also, okay, let me just note first of all, this stretch factor lambda x, this is also equal in this case to the norm, the operator norm of the linear map dfx, right? Remember the operator norm is the supremum of this stretch factor over all non-zero vectors, all right? So this is constant in V, so it's equal to lambda x, this supremum. Okay, now what is this stretch factor dfx V by V? I can write it in terms of distances as a limit t tends to zero of the distance in N between fx and f of gamma V t, where gamma V is the geodesic in M, uh, with uh, base point x and initial velocity v, okay? So that means here's x and here's v and gamma v is the geodesic which starts with initial velocity v, okay? So I move a distance t along this. And then I look at the distance between fx and f of gamma vt divided by the distance between x and gamma vt. So then it's easy to see as t tends to zero, this ratio tends to this norm dfx v divided by norm v. Okay. So now this is in terms of distances. And the fact that this equation star here, this is independent of, of v. This is constant in v. What that means is in all directions, the ratio of these distances tends to lambda x. So in other words, what this means is that the limit as y tends to x from any direction of dfx, dfx fy divided by dxy, this exists, is positive and finite and equals lambda x, okay? So being conformal, I can say it purely in terms of distances that this limit y tends to x dfx fy divided by dxy this limit exists for all x and is positive and finite okay now this is something purely in terms of distances so therefore it makes sense to define this notion of conformal for metric spaces okay so now we say a map between metric spaces of f from z1 rho 1 to z2 rho 2 is conformal if for any xi in z1, the limit, uh, so this is what I will call the derivative of the conformal map df with respect to the matrix rho 1 rho 2 of xi. Uh, this is the limit eta tends to xi, rho 2 of f xi f eta divided by rho 1 of xi eta this limit exists is positive and finite, okay? <coughs> right, so this generalizes conformal maps from Riemannian manifolds to metric spaces. And we've already seen examples of conformal maps. If x, y are cat minus one spaces, and I choose base points little x in x, little y in y, then we saw last time that any for any Mobius map f, from boundary X to boundary Y, this limit exists, right? We saw this last time. So therefore any Mobius map is a conformal map from del X with the metric, the visual metric rho X to del Y with the visual metric rho Y, okay? So in particular, if I take X is a cat minus one space and little X is a point in X, and if gamma is a group which acts on X by isometries, then I know that isometries of cat minus one space extend to Mobius maps between the boundaries. So any little gamma and capital gamma extends to a Mobius map from boundary X to boundary X. And Mobius maps are conformal 
So that means that gamma acts on the boundary by Mobius maps. And therefore, gamma acts on the metric space del x rho x by conformal maps. Okay, so if you have an action on a cat minus one space by isometries, that gives you a conformal action of the group on the boundary. Okay, that gives you a conformal action of the group on the boundary of the cat minus one space. And uh, we will write uh, mod gamma, gamma prime sub x of xi. This is just a notation. This will be this derivative d gamma as a conformal map uh, with respect to the matrix rho x and rho x on boundary x. Okay. In other words, this uh, gamma x prime xi is the limit eta tends to xi rho x of gamma xi gamma eta divided by rho x of xi eta. Okay. Now this limit we can compute because the, first of all, note the visual matrix, they behave well with respect to isometries. So if I change the base point to gamma inverse X, then I, that's the same as applying gamma inverse to both these points here. So this visual distance above is the same as the distance rho gamma inverse X, gamma inverse of gamma xi, gamma inverse of gamma eta. Okay, because gamma is an isometry. So it will take visual distances based at X to visual distances based at gamma inverse X. And now this becomes rho gamma inverse X of xi eta divided by rho X of xi eta, right? And limit eta tends to xi. This limit is exactly what we defined last time to be the derivative between the two visual metrics based at gamma inverse X and at X. So this becomes d rho sub gamma inverse x divided by d rho x of xi. And this, we found a formula for this last time. It was in terms of the Busemann function. So therefore, this becomes equal to e to the Busemann function of x gamma inverse x comma xi. Okay, so we have a formula for this derivative uh, mod gamma prime x, xi with respect to the visual metric rho x is e to the b x gamma inverse x xi. Okay. Now I want to come to the next thing, which is conformal measures. So first, let me recall for you the change of variables formula for uh, diffeomorphisms in Rn. So suppose f is a diffeomorphism between open sets u and v in Rn, a C1 diffeomorphism, and lambda is Lebesgue measure on Rn. Then we know by the change of variables formula that for any measurable set E in U, the Lebesgue measure of F of E is equal to the integral over E of the determinant of dfx, d lambda x, right? This is the change of variables formula. Yes. Now, if F is a conformal map from Rn to Rn, from between these open sets in Rn, then it's easy to see because uh, uh, df stretches the same in all directions. It's easy to see that the determinant of dfx is equal to the conformal factor norm dfx to the power n. Okay. It's equal to norm dfx to the power n. So therefore, this change of variables formula for a conformal map, it becomes that lambda of f of e is equal to the integral over E of norm dfx power n d lambda x. Okay. So now here we have this exponent n here coming here. This norm dfx is the stretch factor of the conformal map. And that is being raised to the power n when you compute the change in volume. But more generally, now we can consider what is called the delta dimensional Hausdorff measure, H delta on Rn, then it turns out for the Hausdorff measure, if F is conformal, uh, for the delta dimensional Hausdorff measure, what will happen is H delta of F of E will be the integral over E of norm dfx power delta. Okay, so instead of power N, it will be power delta uh, dH delta of X. 
So Lebeck measure is a special case of this Hausdorff measure. Lebeck measure lambda is Hn on Rn. It's the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure. So now let me say, what is the Hausdorff measure? So this is defined for any metric space. So suppose Zd is a metric space and delta is a non-negative number, real number. So not necessarily an integer. Then you can define a measure on Z called the delta dimensional Hausdorff measure, H delta. So this is defined as follows. H delta of a set E is what you do is you take coverings of E by count countable coverings of E by balls. And uh, for each epsilon, you look at all the coverings by balls of E where all the radii of the ball are less than or equal to epsilon, okay? Then you take the sum of the radii power delta. You take the sum of the radii power delta, and then you take the infimum over all such coverings of uh, maximum radius less than or equal to epsilon. So this for each epsilon, this gives you some number. And as epsilon decreases, your set of coverings also decreases. So you're taking infimum over a smaller set. So the infimum increases. So as epsilon decreases, this infimum will increase monotonically to a limit. Okay, so you take the limit, then epsilon tends to zero of the infimum of these sums, radii power delta, where you look at all countable coverings by balls of radius less than or equal to epsilon. So you can see that uh, if you're familiar enough with Lebesgue measure in Rn, when delta is equal to n, if I take the sum of the radii power n, then basically this will give me some multiple of the Lebesgue measure, right? It will give me a constant multiple of the Lebesgue measure. Is this clear? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So this makes sense for any uh, metric space and for any positive real number delta. Now, we can define what is called a conformal measure. So suppose gamma is a group which acts by a conformal action on a metric space, Z comma rho. So the example to keep in mind is a group of isometries of a cat minus one space acting on its boundary equipped with a visual metric. That is a conformal action on a metric space. And suppose delta is a non-negative real number. Then a measure nu on Z is said to be a delta conformal measure for gamma, for the group gamma, if for all gamma and gamma and for all measurable sets E, nu of gamma E is equal to the integral over E of mod gamma prime xi power delta d nu of xi, where as usual mod gamma prime xi means the stretch factor of the conformal map gamma. It's the derivative d gamma with respect to rho and rho. Okay. Is this clear? Uh, I have one question, sir. Yes. Can I some space on which, I mean, if we, if we try to define delta dimensional Hausdorff measure, and it, for any set, it always gives infinity. Right. I mean, so uh, the delta dimensional Hausdorff measure will only give you positive numbers. I mean, it will be finite if the uh, space is of dimension uh, greater than or equal to, uh, or is it less than or equal to? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, Yeah, sorry, uh, is of dimension less than or equal to the delta. Okay, uh, my point was uh, this this summation need not be converge, I mean, convergent, right? Correct, correct. Uh, actually, what happens is if you take any set E, then what happens is uh, if this is delta and this axis is H, H delta of E, okay? Then this H delta of E will be infinity up to some point. And then after some, there'll be a, 
a critical delta, say a delta naught, and after that it will be zero. And at delta naught, it could be anything. It could be infinity, it could be zero, or it could be positive and finite. So this delta naught, this is what's called the Hausdorff dimension of E. This is where the uh, Hausdorff measure changes from infinity to zero. This is the Hausdorff dimension of E. Is the picture okay. clear? Okay, so you are saying I can find sequence I mean, converging to zero, I mean, let's say epsilon n, for which it gives I mean, some finite number and for some epsilon n prime, it will give infinity, this kind of thing. No, 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 no. I'm saying, look at this as a function of delta. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, um, E is my some fixed subset or some matrix space. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, for this, I mean, for this delta naught, I will get some different sequence, epsilon A and epsilon N prime, which are converging to zero. And for no, this no, delta... No, 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 no. For this, this limit exists as epsilon tends to zero. If I fix a delta, this limit exists as epsilon tends to zero. I can't get two different epsilon sequences which give me different limits. That does not happen because this limit is monotone. So I will get the same limit no matter what epsilon sequence I take. So in, uh, what do you mean by this? It sometimes is take positive, sometimes it takes infinity. No, no. What I mean is, look, this is a function of delta. I am varying delta here. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let me give you an example. If E is S1, okay, say E is S1. All right. S1 inside R2, are you considering? Or? Yes, 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 okay. yes. Then H delta of S1, this is infinity if delta is less than 1. Uh, this is uh, 2 pi if delta is equal to 1. And this is 0 if delta is bigger than 1. Okay. Do you understand now? Yes, yes, now I got that. Del H delta is like a delta dimensional volume. So S1 is what? It's a one dimensional object. So if I try to calculate its half dimensional volume, that will be infinity. If I try to calculate its three half dimensional volume, that will be zero. But if I try to calculate its one dimensional volume of a one dimensional object, that will give me two pi. Okay. You understand? Yes, yes, I got the point. Uh, but uh, my point was, uh, can we get some space? I mean, as this uh, delta dimensional house dom measure is defined for any matrix space. So now my point, can we get some space X in which I have some subset E and uh, for which the delta dimensional house dom measure is always infinity for any delta? Ah. Right, uh, for any delta. Okay, yeah, so then uh, the that means the Hausdorff dimension will be infinity. Yes. Yeah, you can do that, sure, yeah. You okay. can do that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I mean, you'll have to take like a Hilbert space, basically. A Hilbert space will do it. Okay, I'll check on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you take, I think, the unit sphere in a Hilbert space, its housed of dimension should be infinity. I haven't checked this, but I'm just guessing. I'm guessing it should be. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. So now, uh, is the definition of conformal measure clear? So under the action of a conformal map from the group, uh, the measure changes by integrating the stretch factor power delta, okay? Mod gamma prime power delta. Okay. So now what we want to do, sorry, now what we want to do is construct conformal measures uh, on the boundaries of cat minus one spaces, okay? So these will be called Patterson-Sullivan measures. 
So here's the setup. X is a proper cat minus one space. Gamma acts on X geometrically. So recall, we defined the limit set. That was the accumulation in the boundary of any orbit. It was independent of the choice of orbit. And we defined the critical exponent. So recall, why is it called the critical exponent? Because if I look at what's called the Poincare series, this sum over gamma and gamma, e to the minus dx gamma x. So as a function of s, uh, this is plus infinity if s is less than delta gamma. And this is finite, positive and finite, if s is bigger than delta gamma. Okay. So delta gamma, at delta gamma, it could be infinity or finite. Either is possible. So, okay, so let's assume that uh, our delta gamma is finite, okay? So we have a group whose critical exponent is finite. So this is the case, for example, if x, if gamma is, uh, if uh, x has a, a, a bounded volume growth, I mean, if, if it has exponential growth of finite exponential growth, then this, we know that delta gamma is less than or equal to delta of x. If X is a manifold and you take the log of volumes of ball of radius R divided by R, take Lipsoup, if that is finite, that's the exponent of the space. We know that the exponent of the group is less than or equal to the exponent of the space. So, so that will be true for, uh, let's say, a, a Riemannian manifold of sectional curvature, negative sectional curvature, but bounded below. Okay, so say between minus one and minus some b squared, then the volume growth will be finite. The exponential volume growth will be finite. And so the critical exponent will be finite. Okay. All right. Now, uh, we know that gamma acts on the limit set equipped with a visual metric as a conformal action. Okay. So then the theorem of uh, Patterson and Sullivan uh, <coughs> well, I mean, they did it for hyperbolic manifolds, but later it was generalized to cat minus one spaces, but, but the same construction really. Uh, so essentially the construction is due to Patterson and Sullivan. There is a delta gamma conformal probability measure nu x for gamma supported on the limit set. Okay, so delta gamma is the critical exponent. It turns out that there is a delta gamma, delta conformal probability measure, nu x uh, for gamma supported on the limit set. When you, th this measure is called the Patterson-Sullivan measure for the group, okay, based at the point x. So the proof is given in the notes. I'm just going to here sketch it briefly. So what you do is you look at this Poincare series, phi of s, okay. And then assume first that uh, the Poincare series diverges at the critical exponent. Then what we do is for any S, which is strictly bigger than the critical exponent, you define a probability measure, nu X comma S, which is supported on the orbit okay, of X. So what you do is you take uh, Dirac masses at the orbit of X, and you weight them by these, these terms coming from the Poincare series. So the weight of gamma x is e to the minus d x gamma x. All right. So uh, then you divide by one over phi s. So that means the total mass will be one, right? The total mass of this measure will be one. And this is supported on the orbit and the orbit is contained inside the orbit closure the orbit closure is the orbit union the limit set okay now that this is a compact set this gamma x closure is a compact set and uh, this nu x s this is a sequence of uh, probability measures on a compact space so therefore we know that it has a weakly convergent subsequence right probability measures on a compact space are weakly compact so, uh, so therefore, by weak compactness, we get a probability measure nu x on this uh, orbit closure and the sequence Sn, which converges to the critical exponent, such that nu x Sn converges to nu x weakly on the, on the orbit closure. 
And now uh, we're assuming that the Poincaré series diverges at the critical exponent. That means that as Sn tends to delta gamma, uh, phi of Sn will tend to plus infinity. So what that means is uh, since we're dividing by phi S here, uh, the mass of any point in the orbit will go to zero. So in the limit, uh, this new x will give mass zero to the orbit, uh, but it's supported in the orbit closure. So therefore, all the mass of new will be on the limit set. Okay, so therefore, the support of new will be contained in the limit set. And uh, <coughs> the main thing to show is that it satisfies this delta conformal property. So for that, you look at page eight to nine of the lecture notes. Okay, I'm not doing it here. You can look at it in the lecture notes. It's done there. And uh, this was the case where the Poincaré series diverges at the critical exponent. If it converges at the critical exponent, you have to modify the construction appropriately. But that's also done. Uh, I, I haven't done it in the notes, but it's you can find references for this. It's a very standard construction. Okay. Now, uh, what I have a question. Yes, yes. Yeah, so this uh, delta lambda is then also the host of dimension of, can we say it is the host of dimension of the limit set? Correct, correct. Yes, yes. Also, oh, that is, uh, isn't that surprising? I mean, interesting that, um, that because you are getting delta lambda from I mean, you are kind of getting two different definitions of delta lambda. One is host of, host of dimension it's of the delta lambda, it's a delta gamma. Uh, uh, sorry, delta gamma, yeah. Yeah, delta gamma. Yeah, yes. that's right. So this is an, a nice equality, which was first uh, proved by Sullivan that uh, the critical exponent is the house of dimension of the limit set. Yes. Okay. But I mean, why is it the house of dimension of the limit set? That is going to follow from this. Right, right from the next, uh, uh, this lemma. So the lemma says the following. So I'm, I'm only proving it in the co-compact case. If it's not co-compact, you have to modify the statement appropriately. Uh, but suppose gamma is co-compact. And then for any xi in boundary x and for any epsilon in the interval zero one, let bx xi comma epsilon be the ball around xi of radius epsilon with respect to the visual metric rho x. Okay, so bx xi epsilon is just a visual ball in the boundary. Then the lemma says there exists a constant c bigger than one, such that for any xi naught in delta x and for any epsilon in zero one, the, the uh, Patterson-Sullivan measure nu x of the ball of radius epsilon is looks like a constant is bounded above and below by constants times epsilon to the delta gamma. Okay, so it's like Lebesgue measure in Rn, right? In Rn, the volume of a ball is a constant times the, the radius power n, right? So similarly, here, the, uh, the Patterson-Sullivan measure of any ball, visual ball of radius epsilon is comparable to epsilon to the power delta where delta is the critical exponent. Okay. And then, uh, I'll just uh, give you the idea of the proof. So, uh, what you do is here, I, I, the proof is in the notes. You can look in the notes, but here I'm just giving you a sketch here. So, suppose xi naught is your center of the visual ball and uh, epsilon is the radius. So you let R be log one over epsilon, okay? So this is some positive number. Now you move up a distance R along the geodesic from X to xi naught, all right? To a point Y. Now the action is co-compact. So there exists a, an element of the orbit of X, gamma X, which is close to Y within a uniformly bounded distance of Y. Okay, so what is happening? X is moving. So suppose epsilon is very small. So R is very large. So uh, gamma is moving X to gamma X, which is uh, going towards xi naught, right? And what you can show is that the, the derivative of this gamma is, so gamma should contract things towards xi naught. 
by a factor e to the minus r. Okay, so the derivative of gamma you can show this is approximately it's bounded above and below by constants times e to the minus r, and e to the minus r is epsilon. Okay, so the derivative of gamma is uh, close to epsilon on a large set uh, gamma inverse of this ball. So what happens when you take gamma inverse of this visual ball around xi naught? That will give you a set of uniform of diameter uniformly bounded below. Okay, and uh, so therefore. What happens now you use the conformality. So Patterson Sullivan measure of this ball, I write it as nu x of gamma of gamma inverse of bx xi naught r. So by the definition of a delta conformal, this is equal to the integral over gamma inverse bx xi naught r of uh, mod gamma prime uh, xi to the power delta gamma d nu x of xi. And this mod gamma prime xi, up to constants, it's equal to epsilon. So this will become up to constants. This is just epsilon to the delta. And I'm integrating with respect to nu x. So this will become up to constants, nu x of this gamma inverse of this ball times epsilon to the delta. Okay. And the point is this gamma inverse of this ball, the way I've chosen gamma, uh, this uh, ball, small ball gets a uh, map to a large ball of fixed diameter bounded below and so this uh, this uh, measure is a well it's bounded above by one because nu x is a probability measure and it's bounded below by a uniform constant all right because this ball has uniformly bound diameter uniformly bounded below so so this becomes some constant i can absorb it in the constants so therefore up to constants this measure is comparable to epsilon to the delta, okay? So that's where we use the conformality and we use the group action basically that small sets on the boundary get mapped to large sets, okay? You have this expanding and contracting dynamics of these hyperbolic elements. So that's what we're crucially using here, all right? So, uh, now, uh, as a corollary of this lemma, uh, we get that nu x is mutually absolutely continuous with respect to the delta gamma Hausdorff measure of the boundary with the visual metric rho x. Okay, that follows from the definition of the delta gamma Hausdorff measure. All right, the point is the delta gamma Hausdorff measure is in terms of uh, sums of radii of balls to the power delta and uh, new of a ball of radius epsilon looks like a radius uh, power delta. So, so from this, you can show that uh, these two measures are uh, the Patterson-Sullivan measure and the Hausdorff, delta Hausdorff measure. Uh, these are mutually absolutely continuous. Okay. So for example, if I do this for x equal to hn, the hyperbolic space, which is the ball, let's say bn, so the boundary is uh, the unit sphere Sn minus one and uh, the visual metric uh, we saw last time is half times the caudal metric. When I take uh, the base point X to be the origin of the ball, then this visual metric is just half times the caudal metric. And if gamma acts on Hn co-compactly, then I saw from last time that the critical exponent delta gamma is equal to the volume growth of the space Hn and for Hn, we can compute explicitly the volume growth. It's equal to N minus one. Okay. And uh, that means that uh, nu x, the Patterson-Sullivan measure in this case is absolutely continuous with respect to N minus one Hausdorff measure of Sn minus one with the caudal metric. And the N minus one Hausdorff measure of Sn minus one is nothing but the Lebesgue measure on Sn minus one. Okay, so in this case, for a co-compact group acting on uh, acting on uh, uh, Hn, the Patterson-Sullivan measure is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure on Sn minus one. Okay. Okay. So now I need the next ingredient in the proof, 
which is the geodesic flow. Okay. So, uh, uh, just one question. I have till 11.15, right? The time. Or in them? Yes, yes. You can continue. Huh? Okay. Uh, uh, quarter past 11, right? 11.15. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, fine. I'll try and finish. Okay. okay. So, let me talk a bit about the geodesic flow. So, suppose X bar is a closed negatively curved manifold. X is the universal cover and gamma is the fundamental group. So what is the geodesic flow of X bar? Well, it's it's a flow, I mean, a, a one parameter group of uh, uh, homeomorphisms uh, of the, well, diffeomorphisms really, of the unit tangent bundle of X bar. So that means the set of unit norm tangent vectors in X bar. So what do you do? You take V, which is a unit tangent vector, and then you take the unique geodesic gamma whose initial velocity gamma prime zero is equal to V and you map that to gamma prime T and that is defined to be phi T of V. Okay, in other words, the picture is very simple. Here's V, you take the geodesic which starts from, uh, uh, which starts with velocity V and then you follow it along till time T and then you'd look at the tangent vector at time T. And that is defined. So V moves to phi T of V. This is the geodesic flow. All right. And it's called a flow because it satisfies this property. Phi T composed phi S is equal to phi T plus S. All right. So these uh, maps form a group, a one parameter group. Okay. And now we say that mu, a measure on uh, the unit tangent bundle is flow invariant if uh, the measure of uh, phi t of e is equal to the measure of e for all e and for all t. All right. So the measure doesn't change under action of the geodesic flow. The measure of any set doesn't change. So now I'm going to talk about uh, a correspondence between uh, um, uh, invariant measures for the geodesic flow and what's called geodesic currents. So let me explain. So first we define this space del 2x. This is uh, the boundary x cross boundary x minus the diagonal. All right. And I fix a base point x in x. And I let pi be the natural projection from the unit tangent bundle of x to the manifold x. All right. Then we have a homeomorphism phi, which is called the Hoff parametrization from the unit tangent bundle to the space del 2x cross r. What does it do? So I take a tangent vector, a unit tangent vector v, as in this picture. Now v determines a, a unique bi-infinite geodesic. Now that bi-infinite geodesic, it converges in positive time to some endpoint v plus, and it converges in negative time to some endpoint v minus. Okay. And this gives me a pair of points, a distinct point. So that's an element of del 2x. So V maps to V plus V minus. And then, <coughs> uh, so, so the endpoints of uh, this geodesic, it determines V up to a translation along this geodesic. So I need to know where V is along this geodesic. How do I know that? Well, I look at the horospheres passing through X and the horospheres passing through the base point of V. I take the horospherical distance between them, right? This horospherical distance, it completely determines where V is along this geodesic, right? So that gives me the R component. That is the Boseman function of X pi V, V plus. Okay, so this map will be a bijection, all right? This map will be a bijection. And in fact, it's a homeomorphism. It's a homeomorphism. All right. So uh, why is this nice? Because this conjugates the geodesic flow on T1x to, in this space, del 2x cross R, it conjugates it to translations by T in the R factor. In other words, I have this commutative diagram. 
I have the geodesic flow phi t from t one x to t one x, and uh, so v maps to phi t v. But if I apply this uh, Hoff uh, parameterization phi on both sides, then on the right hand side the geodesic flow becomes a flow of translations in the real coordinate. Uh, xi eta s goes to xi eta s plus t. Right? You can see that if I uh, flow, if I apply the geodesic flow here, the endpoints don't change, right? V plus and V minus don't change. All that changes is this horospherical distance. If I flow by time t, you can see this horospherical distance will increase by t, right? So on this side, this becomes a flow of translations. S goes to S plus t, okay? And now I can write the tangent bundle of the the quotient manifold x bar below as the quotient of t one x by gamma. T one x is the tangent bundle unit tangent bundle of the universal cover, and uh, the group acts on that. So I can quotient to get the unit tangent bundle of the quotient, and then uh, this is also the same as del two x cross r quotiented by gamma, where the action on del two x here is just the diagonal action. Uh, gamma dot xi eta is equal to gamma xi gamma eta. Okay. Now, what is a geodesic current? A geodesic current is a locally finite Borel measure beta on the space del two x, which is gamma invariant. Okay, so why why do we want to look at geodesic currents? because of the following so suppose i take a finite flow invariant measure mu on the quotient on t1 uh, the unit tangent bundle of the quotient x bar then i can lift it to a measure on the unit tangent bundle of x on the universal cover that will be a locally finite flow invariant a uh, gamma invariant once i lift i get a gamma invariant measure mu tilde on the uh, unit tangent bundle of x and using the Hoff parameterization, uh, this will give me a measure on del 2x cross r. And since I started with a flow invariant measure on t1x on del 2x cross r, I'll get a measure which is translation invariant, right? Because the geodesic flow becomes translations on del 2x cross r. So I'll get a translation invariant gamma invariant measure. And once it's a translation invariant measure, then it's easy to see it has to be a product measure on this product space. So omega, this uh, measure has to be of the form beta cross dt, where dt is the Lebesgue measure on the R factor. And beta is a measure on del 2x, which is gamma invariant and which is locally finite. In other words, beta is a geodesic current. So therefore, we get a one-to-one -one correspondence between finite flow invariant measures on the quotient on the unit tangent bundle of x bar and geodesic currents on del 2x okay so to give you an example the simplest example of this correspondence suppose gamma is a closed geodesic in x bar okay this this closed geodesic then if i look at its set of tangent vectors gamma prime t then that is a periodic orbit of the geodesic flow in the quotient t1x bar. And that has a natural one dimensional Lebesgue measure, which is an invariant measure for the, uh, for the geodesic flow, right? I just take the natural measure on this closed orbit of the periodic of the geodesic flow. This measure is obviously flow invariant. What does this flow invariant measure correspond to? Well, what I do is I take on what what geodesic current does it correspond to well on the right hand side i take all lifts of gamma to the universal cover so the lifts will look something like this in this picture it will be a countable collection of bi infinite geodesics which is locally finite and uh, then for each bi infinite geodesic i take its endpoints right and i so that's an element of del 2 gamma uh, del 2x sorry that's an element of del 2x i put a dirac mass there and then i take the sum over g in gamma of dirac masses at 
these uh, uh, pairs of points g gamma plus g gamma minus okay so i just put dirac masses at all the pairs of n points on the lifts of this closed geodesic so this is a geodesic current this will be a gamma invariant measure on del 2x and it is locally finite because this collection of geodesics is locally finite okay and uh, under this correspondence between flow invariant measures and geodesic currents an ergodic flow invariant measure corresponds exactly to an ergodic measure for the group action on del 2x okay so that's because this correspondence bit mu to beta is a convex correspondence and therefore we know that ergodic measures are uh, extreme points of the convex set of invariant measures so because this is a convex uh, co uh, correspondence it maps extreme points to extreme points all right so therefore ergodic measures correspond to ergodic measures ergodic currents okay all right and then uh, there is a natural uh, so i won't have time to talk about this uh, there's a notion of what's called measure theoretic entropy of an invariant measure and there's something called topological entropy for a continuous flow and then uh, so this is in the notes but uh, i won't have time to talk about this so let me just skip this uh, but there is, uh, for the geodesic flow, uh, basically you can define an invariant of a, of a flow of a measure. If you have an invariant measure, then you can define something called uh, the measure theoretic entropy of the flow with respect to the invariant measure. And uh, then you look at the set of all invariant flow invariant measures and you try to maximize the uh, measure theoretic entropy. It turns out for the case of the geodesic flow on a negatively curved manifold, it's a theorem of Bowen that there is a unique measure of maximal entropy. Okay, there is a unique flow invariant measure of maximal entropy, and that is called the Bowen Margulis measure. Okay, so it's the unique measure of maximal entropy. So this is in the notes, uh, at least a little bit of it. You can look at it. So I'll, I'm going to skip ahead. So the, this Bowen-Margulis flow invariant measure, this will correspond to a Bowen-Margulis current, a geodesic current. So what is that current? That current, it turns out, is defined in terms of the Patterson-Sullivan measures. Okay. So uh, okay. So we have x bar equal to x mod gamma. Little x is a base point. New x is the Pat Patterson-Sullivan measure. Here, x bar is a closed negatively curved manifold. And let's just recall if I have a measurable map with a measurable inverse between measurable spaces Z1 to Z2, then for any measure mu on Z2, I can define a pullback measure F upper star mu on Z1, where F upper star mu of a set E is just mu of F of E, where E is a measurable subset of Z1. Okay. So any measure on Z2 pulls back to a measure on Z1. Okay. And if I take a uh, uh, an L1 function with respect to mu and I look at the measure h times d mu so I multiply mu by the function h to get a, a new measure then the pullback of h f, f upper star of h d mu is equal to h composed f into d f star mu all right so this formula is somewhat similar to how differential forms pullback if you're familiar with that, then it's similar to how differential forms pull back. It's a similar formula. Okay. Now, let's uh, let's define a, a geodesic current. Uh, well, no, a, a measure on del 2x as follows. Beta. So d beta of xi eta, it is the product measure of uh, Patterson Sullivan d nu x of xi with Patterson Sullivan d nu x of eta, but I divide by the visual metric rho x of xi eta to the power two times delta gamma. All right. 
So the claim is that this measure is actually gamma invariant. In other words, therefore, it is a geodesic current. So uh, note that uh, the Patterson-Sullivan measure being delta conformal, what that means in terms of pullbacks is that gamma upper star of nu x is equal to the function mod gamma prime to the power delta into nu x. That's what uh, it means to be delta conformal. Okay. So now let me look at the pullback of this measure d beta under gamma star. So that will be gamma star d nu x into gamma star d nu, uh, d nu x of xi into gamma star d nu x of eta divided by rho x of gamma xi gamma eta to the power 2 delta. And uh, because the Patterson-Sullivan measure is delta conformal, this gamma star of nu x is mod gamma prime to the delta times nu x. So here this will become mod gamma prime xi to the delta uh, into mod gamma prime eta to the delta. And then below I'll have a rho x gamma xi gamma eta to the two delta. So I multiply and divide by a rho x xi eta to the two delta. Okay. So then what remains here is my original beta. Okay. This is beta. So what I get is mod gamma prime xi to the delta, mod gamma prime eta to the delta, rho x xi eta to the two delta divided by rho gamma in, and this rho x of gamma xi gamma eta is the same as rho gamma inverse x xi eta to the two delta into d beta. Now I know what this mod gamma prime is. It's e to the uh, b Boseman function x gamma inverse x xi and then I'll get another term uh, b x gamma inverse x eta uh, that times delta e to that. And I know what this ratio of two visual metrics is. This is a formula we did last time for the ratio of two visual metrics. This will give me below the same term e to the delta b x gamma inverse x xi plus b x gamma inverse x eta. Therefore, these two will cancel out. And so I'll just get d beta of xi eta. Okay. So therefore, this means that uh, gamma star of d beta is equal to d beta. So therefore, d beta is gamma invariant. Hence, beta is a geodesic current. Okay, so we will denote this geodesic current by mu sub bm. And uh, the reason we're putting bm is it stands for bowen margulis because it's a theorem of Kaimanovich that the flow invariant bowen margulis measure, the measure of maximal entropy, it corresponds to this geodesic current mu bm. Okay. Okay. All right. So now suppose we have two close negatively curved manifolds, x1 bar and x2 bar, okay, with fundamental groups gamma 1 and gamma 2. And suppose we have an isomorphism phi from gamma 1 to gamma 2 between fundamental groups. All right. Then we can do the following. I choose base points x1 and x2 in the universal covers. I look at the orbits of gamma 1 uh, of x1 and the orbits of x2 under gamma 1 and gamma 2. And now because I have an isomorphism from gamma 1 to gamma 2, that gives me a map between the orbits, right? Uh, gamma dot x1 goes to phi gamma dot x2. I get a map between the orbits. And by the Svaric-Milner lemma, because the actions are co-compact, this map is a quasi-isometry between the orbits, okay? This map is a quasi isometry between the orbits. And because phi is a homomorphism, is a group homomorphism, this map between the orbits will conjugate the gamma action on the, the gamma one action on the orbit of x1 to the gamma two action on the orbit of x2. Okay. Now, because it's a quasi isometry and the orbits, we know the limit set in this case is the whole boundary. So the orbits become dense in the boundary. It's possible to show that for a quasi isometry between cat minus one spaces, it extends to a, what's called a quasi Mobius homeomorphism, 
between boundaries. So this will extend to a homeomorphism between the boundaries. Little f uh, from del x1 to del x2. And uh, because the quasi-isometry f0 conjugated the actions on the orbits, this boundary map will conjugate the actions on the boundaries. And this boundary map you can show easily. It's independent of the choice of base points x1 and x2. So we get a unique boundary map. Whenever we have an isomorphism of fundamental groups, we get a, an equivariant uh, homeomorphism between boundaries of the universal covers, which is quasi-Mobius. So quasi-Mobius is like Mobius. I mean, Mobius means uh, cross ratios are preserved. Quasi-Mobius means they're uh, distorted by a bounded amount. So I won't define it precisely, but you can look it up. So I don't have time to define precisely. So now we come to finally one of the main uh, uh, theorem that we need. So for i equal to 1 and 2, let mu BMI be the Bowen-Margulis current of Xi bar okay, on del 2 Xi. Right? So this was the current, the geodesic current defined using Patterson-Sullivan measures. Then the theorem says, so I can, I have this boundary map from del x1 to del x2. So I can look at f cross f. That gives me a map from del 2 x1 to del 2 x2. And so then the theorem says, I can pull back the bowen margulis measure of x2 by f cross f. And if this pullback is equal to a constant multiple of the bowen margulis measure current of x1, okay. And if the critical exponents of gamma 1 and gamma 2 are equal, then we can say that the boundary map is actually Mobius. Okay. So this quasi-Mobius map actually becomes Mobius if Bowen-Margulis measure on the right-hand side pulls back to Bowen-Margulis measure on the left-hand side. And if the critical exponents are equal. So how do we show that? Well, uh, let delta be the common value of the critical exponents and let nu i be the Patterson-Sullivan measure uh, for, for xi. And uh, it's not hard to show that if f cross f pulls back Bowen-Margulis measure to a multiple of Bowen-Margulis current, then uh, f, f pulls back Patterson-Sullivan measure on the right-hand side to something which is absolutely continuous with respect to Patterson Sullivan measure on the left hand side. So now let u be the radon nicotine derivative d f star nu2 divided by d nu1. So then what do we have? We have that uh, a constant times the Bowen Margulis current on the right left hand side d nu1 xi d nu1 eta divided by rho x1 xi eta to the 2 delta is equal to f cross f star of d mu, mu bm2 xi eta. So what happens when you pull back? You'll be pulling back uh, nu2, nu2 cross nu2. So when I pull back nu2, it will be basically nu1 times this radon nicotine derivative. So what I'll get is uh, the radon nicotine derivative u xi into u eta into d nu1 xi d nu1 eta divided by rho x2 of f of xi, f of eta to the 2 delta. Okay, so now uh, both sides are multiples of the product measure d nu1 cross d nu1. So these coefficients have to be the same. So that means a constant divided by rho x1 xi eta to the 2 delta is equal to u xi u eta divided by rho x2 f xi f eta to the 2 delta. So what I can do is I can take this rho x2 f xi f eta to the 2 delta to the other side. And then I take, I raise it to the power 1 over delta. So finally, what I will get is that rho x2 f xi f eta divided by rho x1 xi eta. This splits as a product uh, h xi into h eta for some positive function eta, right? Eta will be basically u to the power 1 over 2 delta times a constant. Okay. You can see that from here. 
and the fact that this ratio splits as a product that will tell me that cross ratios are preserved because if i take the cross ratio of uh, the image of four points f of xi f of xi prime f of eta f of eta prime divided by the cross ratio of the domain points xi xi prime eta eta prime then what will happen here in this ratio of cross ratios i'll get terms like this basically right <coughs> Uh, rho x2 f xi f eta divided by rho x1 xi eta and i'll get a rho x2 f xi prime f eta prime divided by rho x1 xi prime eta prime so those will give me on top h xi h eta into h xi prime h eta prime and then i'll have the other terms and those will give me below h xi h eta prime h xi prime h eta so the denominator will just be a permutation of the numerator so these uh, factors will all cancel and this will become one so that means the image cross ratio is the same as the domain cross ratio in other words f is mobius okay all right so now we can finally give uh, the proof of mostar rigidity so suppose x1 x1 bar and x2 bar are closed hyperbolic manifolds of dimension n greater than or equal to 3 okay then that means the universal covers x1 and x2 are both equal to hn and we know that the critical exponents delta gamma 1 and delta gamma 2 they are both equal to the critical exponent of of hn which is equal to n minus 1 so that means the two patterson sullivan measures new x1 and new x2 these are mutually absolutely continuous with respect to lebesgue measure on sn minus 1 right this is what we saw earlier and uh, now we have uh, so we have an isomorphism between fundamental groups that gives us as we said earlier an equivariant homeomorphism between the boundaries which is quasi mobius right we get a homeomorphism which is quasi mobius so we have a homeomorphism from sn minus 1 to sn minus 1 which is quasi mobius now it's a theorem that a quasi mobius map is what is called quasi conformal okay so i won't get into what is the definition of a quasi conformal map between uh, from rn to rn but uh, well okay yeah you can look it up but uh um there uh, in a sense they're homeomorphisms which are generalizations of conformal maps so conformal maps infinitesimally they map spheres to spheres quasi conformal maps infinitesimally they're differentiable almost everywhere infinitesimally they map spheres to ellipsoids of uniformly bounded eccentricity so that means uh, eccentricity is the ratio of major axis of the ellipsoid to minor axis of the ellipsoid that ratio is uniformly bounded so that means the images of infinitesimal spheres cannot be uh, distorted too much they are uniformly bounded distortion anyway the, the definition is a bit technical so i'm not giving it here what we need to know is that and this is where we need n greater than or equal to 3 if the dimension of sn minus 1 which is n minus 1 if this is greater than or equal to 2 then quasi conformal maps they pull back lebesgue measure to a measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to lebesgue measure okay so in other words they map uh, zero measure sets to zero measure sets they map zero measure sets to zero lebesgue measure sets to zero lebesgue measure sets but what does this mean this means that the uh, since lebesgue measure and the patterson sullivan measures are absolutely continuous with respect to each other in this case this means the pullback of patterson sullivan measure uh, new x2 will be absolutely continuous with respect to patterson sullivan measure new x1 and that means from the definition of the bowen margulis geodesic currents the pullback by f cross f of a uh, bowen margulis measure on the right hand side will be absolutely continuous with respect to bowen margulis measure on the left hand side 
Bowen Margulis geodesic current on the left left hand side, and this means actually that uh, the 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 pullback of uh, uh, mu B M two has to be a constant multiple of the pullback of mu B M one. If they are absolutely continuous with respect to each other, then they have to be constant multiples of each other. Why is this? Because so since this is absolutely continuous with respect to this one, I can look at its radon nicotine derivative, d f cross f star of mu b m two divided by d mu b m one, right? Now because both of these measures are gamma invariant, and f is f conjugates the gamma one action to the gamma two action, uh, this radon nicotine derivative will be gamma one invariant. This should be a gamma one. This will be gamma one invariant. Okay, so this radon nicotine derivative is a gamma one invariant a function, and therefore it is constant because the uh, I forgot to say the Bowen Margulis measure is an ergodic measure for the geodesic flow. And so therefore the Bowen Margulis current is ergodic, is an ergodic current for the action of uh, gamma one on, on del two uh, X one. So since this action is ergodic uh, with respect to this measure mu BM one, and this function is gamma one invariant, we know that for an ergodic action, any gamma one invariant is almost everywhere constant. So that means this radon nicotine derivative has to be constant. And therefore, that means this pullback is equal to a constant times Bowen Margulis measure on the left hand side. Okay. Therefore, by the previous theorem, that means that my quasi Mobius map F is actually a Mobius map. Right. So now what is F? F is a Mobius map from boundary HN to boundary HN, which conjugates gamma one action to gamma two action. But I know that from last time, Mobius maps of boundary HN, they extend to isometries of HN. So therefore, this map now extends to an isometry from HN to HN. And because the boundary map conjugates the boundary actions, the isometric extension will also conjugate the isometric actions. So I get an equivariant isometry. And because it conjugates the gamma one action to the gamma two action, Therefore, it descends to an isometry between the quotients from x1 bar to x2 bar. Okay. And that uh, means that x1 bar is isometric to x2 bar, which is what we wanted to show. Okay. So that's the proof of Mostow rigidity. And uh, so here we used crucially that uh, at the last step, so we showed that our uh, boundary map is Mobius. At the last step, we use the fact that a Mobius map from boundary HN to boundary HN extends to an isometry from HN to HN, right? And that was how we got an isometry from between the quotient manifolds, the hyperbolic manifolds. So finally, to conclude, let me just say for variable negative curvature, that if the manifolds are not hyperbolic, not constant curvature, but the curvature is variable, but negative, then we have the following theorem. So suppose x1 bar and x2 bar are closed negatively curved n manifolds and we have an isomorphism of fundamental groups. Okay. So then we know that this will give my give me an equivariant uh, quasi Mobius homeomorphism from boundary x1 to boundary x2, right? That we've seen. Then the following are equivalent. So one x1 bar, x2 bar have the same mark length spectrum. Okay, so we know what that means. That means this isomorphism, it uh, um, preserves lengths. In other words, length function of x2 bar composed with phi is equal to length function of x1 bar. That's the first condition. This is if and only if the critical exponent of gamma 1 is equal to the critical exponent of gamma 2 and uh, f cross f star of mu bm2 is equal to a constant times mu bm1. This is equivalent to 
uh, f from boundary x1 to boundary x2 being Mobius. And this is equivalent to there is a homeomorphism psi from uh, the unit tangent bundle of x1 bar to the unit tangent bundle of x2 bar, which conjugates the geodesic floor of x1 bar to the geodesic floor of x2 bar. Okay. And it is, uh, in a certain sense, compatible with the isomorphism of fundamental groups. Uh, in the sense that, you know, an element of the fundamental group, uh, it gives you a, a closed geodesic in the free homotopy class. That closed geodesic is a periodic orbit for the, the geodesic flow. And this conjugacy of geodesic flows, it maps the periodic orbit to a periodic orbit. That periodic orbit on the right hand side corresponds to the element of the fundamental group phi gamma on the right hand side. So, okay, so finally, this uh, says that uh, for variable negative curvature, these four things are all the same information. In other words, uh, Uh, the marked length spectrum is the same information as uh, the uh, the critical exponent together with the bowen margulis current. And that is the same information as the cross ratio on the boundary. And that is the same information as the, the geodesic flow. Okay, so all these are equivalent. The question is, is any of these enough to equivalent to isometry of the manifolds. Okay, and so, uh, so you can see if you have the same mark length spectrum, then the boundary map is Mobius. And then you could try to imitate the proof of Mostar rigidity. And what you want to do is extend this Mobius map to an isometry. So finally, to finish, uh, this leaves us with the question of what you can call Mobius rigidity. So suppose X, Y are complete simply connected Riemannian manifolds of sectional curvature less than or equal to minus one. And suppose F from boundary X to boundary Y is a Mobius map. Then the question is, does F extend to an isometry from X to Y? Okay, and now you can see the motivation for this question. If this is true, then this will say that the marked length spectrum conjecture is also true. Right, because if you have the same Mark length spectrum, then the boundary map is a Mobius, and then it extends to an isometry, and then you're done. All right, like in the proof of Mostar rigidity. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I think I'll stop here.